Basketball has its sixth man, the unsung hero who comes off the bench to help his team to victory. Football has its twelfth man, an unseen but powerful energy that urges the home team forward. Now, Christianity has its thirteenth apostle, a faithful witness to the love, mercy, and truth of Jesus Christ. How about you? Will you be the thirteenth apostle? One week later, and we're still asking the question, is God great? This is part two. We could go into infinity. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Thirteenth Apostle, where we explore the good, the beautiful, and the true of the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church, and encourage everybody listening, including each other, to be that Thirteenth Apostle. I'm joined here, as always, by my co-host, confrere, great friend, and uh, troublemaker, Dan <laughs> Duddy. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to give the audience a little take one day of the outtakes, okay, of our, uh, you know, what's ended up on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Those are the best times. <laughs> we, we just had a good one right before that mic went on. <laughs> yeah, it was a good warm-up. <clears throat> Nothing like a great laugh to have a good warm-up. I needed uh, a good laugh. Actually, I had a little tear come out of my eye. It's been a long time uh, from the laugh. Oh, gosh, yeah. I love it. It's so, it's the, laughter is the best medicine. Well, we'll say what's the second best, right? What's the first? Strong, a great faith. Oh, you know? of course. Oh, I mean, it might be the third. The second would be, you know, let's say, great family and great friend. Uh, family. Laughter is almost the best medicine, but not quite. <laughs> Laughter, oh, laughter comes from yeah. I agree with you. Laughter comes from having all, all of those in, in alignment, in that order. A pretty cool, uh, cool reflection you just hit me over the head with that you sent with, to me today about our Lord and humor. Oh, do you remember who, who authored that? You sent that that quote to me today, right? On a mini meditation about how it, how how could our Lord not have had a great sense of humor? Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Like because no one, no one will follow or hang around with a wet blanket. Exactly. Right. And uh, yeah, that, he, no, there's no evidence that he that he laughed. It doesn't say in sacred scripture that he laughed. Or you know. Uh, right. Right. But yeah, that's like a lot of things we can reasonably conclude, and certainly with all the 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 banquets he attended, all all the meals he shared, the you know the communal meals. Yeah. We're going to keep a straight face for all the meals. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm sure he had a wonderful sense of humor. Yeah. And you kind of had to have a sense of humor to actually get through. It, uh, humor is really generosity, you know, especially if it's not at the expense of someone else, and it's really not funny right. unless, you know, a wise guy standing around and, you know, laugh at wise guy stuff. But for the most part, humor in its, for its proper intention is a beautiful virtue. You know, if you're you're doing it to make someone smile, our buddy Donald, right? Donald Hand talked talked about humor at our retreat this past Saturday. Exactly, what a great retreat that was on the little things that we can give to mankind. You know, mm. and, and uh, that he goes out of his way to make the cashier laugh or the person in line laugh. You know, and and he, he makes me laugh. <laughs> he makes me laugh too. <laughs> his, his, uh, Donald's a great guy. His. Uh, st- it's uh, corny, but what makes me what makes me smile really is his genuine humanness. Exactly, that he's really trying to make people smile. There's no artifice. There's nothing artificial about with, yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah. You know? He's just, and you said it. He's, he's got a. It's like he's got a pure innocence. Uh, you know, there's no guile. I mean, like, he's not trying to. There's no subterfuge. He's just. Yeah. yeah. But, but I'm not sure what that says about you and me. If. That, <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're. I think you're devoid of guile. Yeah, and I'm devoid of guile. Yeah. Hey, hey, mom. She's like, a real good guile. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, mom. Tom said I'm devoid. I'm devoid of guile. Am I? Am I huh? Yeah, because you're not. A, you're a guy. You're not a guile. <laughs> <laughs> we sound like Donald now. <laughs> Oh, uh, laughter. Oh, my gosh. We should be in the, we, we could do the, uh, like, the Catskills, you know, hey, where there's not Jewish, so. Yeah, 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 yeah man. <laughs> Stop acting like a guy. Oh, uh, gosh. So, obviously, we were in agreement before we started the uh, last episode, part one of God is great, that God is great. 
But, you know, the reason, just to remind our audience, the reason why that whole thing started was because we had gotten a good email from someone. And uh, it was about us and our program and whatnot. And uh, so when Dan's response was, God is great, and God is great always, something like that. And I, I just wanted to know, let's flesh that out. As always, you know, things we say, prayers we say, uh, responses in Mass, let's say. We're so quick to, to say something, but we really have never thought that through. And we agreed, and this is an easy thing to agree on, that there can be a wrong time to say the right thing. And uh, so, Dan, you obviously you were you made this point very well that if 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 I was going through something really bad, I was suffering, and you said not you know an enthusiastic voice, God is great, you know, I it would ring hollow to me. Right, might actually upset you. Yeah, as as a cold statement. Uh, yeah, how, how could you be so cold to exclaim that when I'm in such pain? Would probably be a very realistic and understandable reaction from you. If that's the way I handled it. If you had said, if I had said, or the person who's suffering, so if, I, if I'm if i suffering and I say, despite all this, I believe God is great, uh, that's, that's okay, as long as that's not high in the sky thinking that, and I'm not addressing the problem or, yeah. or doing whatever I can to yeah. help solve that, ease yeah. that suffering or end the suffering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think that there's there's loads of scripture passages, you know, about saying God is great. Certainly, a lot of the Psalms, many of the Psalms, mm-hmm. you know, we that's part of our, that's part of the uh, the Mass when we have the, uh, let's say the Alleluia, the praise the Lord part, and we're saying these are almost always, if not always, Psalms, and it's always about glorifying God and God is in, in God's greatness. Right. Yeah. But what I what means the most to me is when I see that not in a praise psalm, but in you and I have talked about this, but in a psalm of lamentation mm-hmm. where somebody is going through something they're having a real struggle. Yeah. And they're they're, they're trying to figure out and they may be asking God and, and crying out to God, but and they often are in those psalms. But they're crying out, and the reason they're crying out to God is, it is, they have such a close relationship with Him. Yeah. And help me to understand why this is happening, and yeah. help me to get through it. Yeah. That's the most important part. Help me to get through it. Yeah. I acknowledge your greatness. Please help me to get through this. Yeah. I, and I think you know it's commensurate with our pain and our suffering uh, that how deeply we do seek out God's greatness. You know, without actually verbalizing it, and maybe we do, uh, but the uh, the point being that if we're in the depths of our suffering, you know, we want to see God's greatness at those very same depths. You know, at this point, Lord, I am suffering so much beyond, you know, it's inconceivable that I ever thought that I could ever suffer like this. Please be as inconceivable to me in your greatness at this time of suffering. Uh, I think that we do see God's greatness more profoundly, and it becomes more tattooed on our heart, our hearts and our souls, when we feel God's warmth, greatness, and care, and uh, we, we, we gain that confidence in Him in our suffering. Not only those things, but we come to understand that we are more, far more like His Son, Jesus Christ, because of the suffering. And then uh, that identity of being sons or daughters is just far more enhanced and ingrained in us. And uh, hence the joy of being a son or a daughter of God. God the Father in heaven becomes, uh, you know, just just more in us. And I think b- because of that, we, we walk with less trepidation that there will be more suffering in our lives because we know that suffering is a part of this life. It's, it's a bit of a, uh, of a discipline from a loving father that uh, the, the discipline of suffering and the anguish of pain However that might come, whether it's physical or it's mental or emotional pain, is really, uh, you know, God's letting that happen to us in this fallen world, as fallen creatures, to bring us closer to Him, you know, to the far greater good. Just like our own fathers, right, Tom? Uh, My father was a great disciplinarian, 
And, uh, you know, at the time, I was, I didn't feel like, oh, Dad, thanks for loving me so much. But, you know, as time has passed. Well, great doesn't always mean good. Like, that, that's a, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah. You understand it. It's more of like, you know, the greatness of a storm or, a, you know, the, yes. the size of it, the magnitude. But, I mean, yeah. the magnitude of God's, of God's love, and this is what you're, yeah. I know this is what uh, you, you mean, and you know, go ahead. I know you want but to say something. But we won't. We won't really know the magnitude of God's love in our suffering without knowing His Son, and that God gave us His only begotten Son to suffer for us, for our fallenness, for our sins, and therefore to become truly Christ-like. Once again, as our as our good friend Monsignor Mike Mannion says, you know, you got to look good on wood. If you really want to know Christ, you've got to kind of live. With Christ, you got to live his sufferings and his pains to really know him. And who is it that brings us to the Father? Is Christ. So we will come to the Father much more deeply through our sufferings, and uh, we we have to we have to accept that suffering is an opportunity for God to work in our lives for heaven's sake. And and if suffering, if the word suffering is replaced with discipline, then we can say discipline is an opportunity for God to work in our lives. For heaven's sake, you know, and uh, we know that that's what our our earthly fathers did for us. It was an opportunity for them to work in our lives to bring us to the greater good. We felt the pain, we felt it from the discipline, and then we we would we would walk away from it and say, once we came to the mature realization of why our fathers were the way they were. If in fact your father was like that, I get the idea that your father was, you know, a very good man. Uh, actually, you you are. You are the product of that. You are a very good man yourself. So, thank you, Dan. Yeah, truly, truly, truly. So, whether that realization comes twenty years later, or two days later, or two hours later, you know, I have had my sons come back to me and said, "Dad, thank you." You know, I, I've had them come back. Thank you for raising us the way, the way you have, because they have friends that have not been, and their friends suffer for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. I think it. As so often with life, it does take a while for us to see the truth. Uh, for you know, wisdom comes with age, and yeah. Yeah. presumably, the question though is, or the, maybe the difficulty is, uh, I know people. I've been, I've interacted with people who have no relationship with God, the Father, because yeah. they have no ability to identify with that Father because of their bad relationship with with their earthly father. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And. That's understandable. I think the difficulty for some people is my father, so I can speak, and I'm sure you were saying the same thing. Your father wasn't, quote-unquote, punishing or disciplining you or me for the sake of punishing or disciplining us. It was because of something we did. Yes. So the difficulty for people is to, to, to make the correlation, okay, my dad punished me, but not, but he didn't do anything wrong. He was punishing me. He didn't do anything wrong. If we're saying that bad things happen because of God, yeah. that God, God is testing us, so He does something, uh, He does something uh, bad to us. That is a major turnoff to people to a life of faith. Yeah, to think that well. It's a classic question, you know, why does a good God allow bad things? Or in their thinking, why does a good God cause bad things? Because that's what, there's a lot of theology out there, a lot of teaching, a lot of instruction that this happened, God smite you, yeah, right? Because you're a sinner, so you're a sinner, and God's going to do something evil to you. Yeah. You know, but you know, Jesus' response uh, in the Gospel of John to the people saying, well, is this, is the blind man blind? Because of the sins of his father, the sins of, the sins of his ancestors, and Jesus gave a resounding no. Yeah, amen. It's not from God. This is not a punishment. Yeah. This is so God's glory can be manifest by Jesus' healing, healing by forgiving his sins. So he makes it clear there. Now you can look at there's other certainly in the Old Testament. There's no shortage of uh, phrases where God's uh, Chastising. Yeah, you look at Job. We t- we touched upon Job uh, last week. Yeah. Now, God's saying that He's allowing Satan to have his way with up, not completely. Right. Don't do anything. Don't kill him. 
Yeah. Right? So, so God's allowing it. And, and Job does not, Job never curses God. Yeah. He curses himself. He curses the day he was born. He makes these so many references to the day he was born. Why did you bring this boy in on this hour, on this, on this day, in this year? Why did you bring this boy out of this woman? Why did you, why did you let me live? Why did you bring me into creation? Yeah. Right. If, if, or if I'm going to disappoint you so badly, if I'm going to be this sinner. But in the beginning, God said, in the beginning, in the beginning of Job, God makes it clear that he's an upright man. Yeah. But he doesn't say he's perfect. So obviously he's a sinner. Yeah. Yeah. But you lost one child, he lost all his children. I think it was ten, seven sons yeah, and three daughters. Un- unbelievable. Yeah. But things things came back. Yeah. But he wants to know why. He 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 wants he he's How could he you wants not? some answers. Yeah. And he one of his answers is how do I live like this? Well, didn't our Lord kind of in his in his as as son of man also have those same expressions at some point in his anguish on the cross? You know, why have you forsaken me? Right? I mean, absolutely. Isn't, isn't that just? I, I, I mean, it, it's a god awful thing for our Lord to say because of His immense pain and suffering because of our sins, but it's also because of our sins that we suffer, and it's also because of what He said on that cross. You know, that enables us to be okay with feeling that. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, it, we just have a, an amazingly relatable God. And one thing, you know, that you and I have always professed to do, and I, I find it to be so important, and I, I can't say it enough, and in our, our upcoming parish missions that we hope to do real soon, uh, and now that we're, you know, we're, we're getting ourselves very organized for that, we had a great retreat two days ago, is that, you know, we need our young people especially, and old, to really come down to the dirt and relate to the realness of the men and the, the women and the children that we read about in, in the Old and the New Testament, we are all the same. A matter of time had passed by, but time is only for us as human beings, you know, as fallen human, fallen human beings. Time does not exist in God's world. You know, God, there, there is no time with God. He sees us standing still down here. Time stands still. We are always in the present you know, to God. And so so here we are, we have we have Paul who writes about something that could could have been written today. I'm gonna to read it to you. Um, this is Paul to a uh, letter to Hebrews. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as sons. For what son is there whom whose father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, in which all have shared, you are not sons but bastards. Besides this we have had our earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not then submit all the more to the Father of spirits and life? They discipline us for a short time, as seemed right to them, but he does so for our benefit, in order that we may share his holiness. At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet later it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. And that's from Paul. Those are trained by the suffering? Trained by the discipline, yeah. And the suffering that comes from the discipline, which puts us on the... Which one comes first? The suffering comes first, and then are you disciplined by the suffering? You're disciplined by the suffering. By the suffering. Yeah. In the same way we're disciplined by our parents. We are disciplined by by the suffering, but the uh, and 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 so it goes to the suffering that that is inflicted upon us, or that we inflict upon ourselves here on earth as fallen creatures, uh, or mishaps. My son, my son was killed through a mishap, which is far too light of a term for the death of my son, but through the 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 uh, fallenness and the lack of judgment. Uh, of a drunken driver. Uh, so our sufferings come from inflictions, our own actions, but in a fallen world that God oversees and allows to happen. 
So we are going to be disciplined through our own fallenness to come to know Christ, who literally suffered for our sins. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does make sense, and it's this: we we can we go back and forth with the Old Testament and the New Testament. Job wants he's asking God, "Why do you not pardon my offense?" So again, he's not he doesn't turn the the, the eye of condemnation on God. It's the which a lot of people do. Yeah. But he's turning it on himself. Now, there's obviously a massive amount of humility in that. Uh, to think it's something that he did. It, it, why do you not pardon my offense or take away my guilt? You know, for soon I should... This is, this is how fervent Job's desire to ease or end his suffering. He says, For soon I shall lie down in the dust, and should you seek me, I shall be gone. Mm. He, he doesn't want to be around anymore. Yeah, But he's not going to do anything. Somehow he's got... He's got the training, the way he lived, because he was an upright and moral guy, however imperfect, still a moral and upright guy. You know, if, if I heard, if I could put that on my resume and say, listen, I got it from God that I'm a moral and upright guy, that's not too shabby. So he, he uh, so, I mean, he, but he didn't say that to Job. He said that to Satan. Right. And, and that, Stimulated Satan even more to go after after him, and it said in in Job, it's got it makes clear more than one time that Satan's roaming the earth, that he's patrolling it, and that's the that's one of the main tie-ins for our prayer to Saint Michael, the Archangel, yeah, who who the the, the demons who prowl around the world seeking the ruin of souls, amen, yeah, All right, and so that's this is this is part of it's tied in with Job that this is. Satan patrols. He's looking around, and God's giving him the green light, saying, "Okay, it's up to you." Because I believe in I believe in Job. Thank you for saying that. I was hoping you, I wanted you to say that exactly. He believes in, and yeah. to, and whether or not Job knew yeah. that God believed in him, yeah, he maintained that, and that's something that's such a challenge for you. It's been a challenge for me, in any of my suffering, that. It's it's like it's a for, it's it's willpower in a sense. It's a it's a it's a conscious decision that we have to make, and it's not easy to it's make. True. Absolutely true. Yeah. I you know I, faith teaches us, and so many of our prayers teach us that we're we we invite God, we invite Jesus, we invite the Blessed Mother, we invite our community of saints and yeah. angels to walk with us yeah. when we go through things. Especially, we want their company when we're going through bad things because. I want your company yeah. in good and bad, but I need your you need. company, Dan. Big difference. Want and need. Right. Mm-hmm. If I'm going through a struggle, yeah, yeah I'm going to say I want it, but I, mm-hmm. I need it. And the same thing with you. The yeah. same thing with any any of us. Yeah. And I have to wrestle with that. What does that mean? I don't feel God holding my hand. But then i got to say, like we, like we talked about at the retreat, yeah. and I said at the retreat, is, is Christ holding my hand through Dan? Right. Is right. Christ holding my hand through Father Mike? Yeah. Is Christ holding my hand through George Fallon? Yeah, it's a great, great right? reflection. It's a great visual. All these, and the, and the, it's the, true. the people who said things yeah. or did things, I want to believe that. Go. Yeah, amen, totally. And what hit me was you, you're talking about Job being a moral and upright man, okay? And all of us being the same through the history of man. Uh, men and women, moral and upright men and women, are those that have practiced virtues. They have kept their principles organized. And you know, that's one of my themes. And you know, no matter how down we are, if we have practiced our virtues and we are considered moral and upright people, we're going to, we're going to stand up. We're going to stand upright. And the, as long as those, those virtues uh, that make us moral and upright are upright in the eyes of God, we're going to beat it. We're going to win it. We're going to overcome it. Yeah. And as I often say, that we can't be we can't be uh, again. It's not pie in the sky. It can't be these platitudes, all right? Yeah. Syrupy. It's got to be real. We know you suffer. Yeah. We've been there, and we are there. Yeah. Whoever, whatever we're going through. And we are a community of believers. And our Lord doesn't sympathize. Our Lord empathizes. And that's important for us to remember. He gives us empathy, not sympathy. All right, Danny. 
By the way, we're just going to say real quickly, this is our first, ladies and gentlemen, this is our first live, uh, we're in person, person to person yeah. uh, episode since March. All right, since yeah. March. Yeah, amen. We, we haven't been in the same room for, for this <laughs> yeah, program yeah. since March, so this is wonderful. And we're back We're back together around the microphone. and A lot more enthusiasm, just yeah. because it's so excited. I'm so excited to be here with yeah. you in the same place. So uh, what's coming up next, Danny? Uh, stay tuned for your prayer intentions. Uh, but firstly, the, the Angelus. Let's all pray together. God bless all. WQPHradio.org. Starting a new year. You know, we're really into, getting into it now. Well into January. So remember the, this great station. Yeah. God bless you, Danny. God bless you all. God bless you, Tom. Thank you for listening to The 13th Apostle with Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey. For more information on Dan, visit his website at www.danduddy.com or email dcduddy at gmail.com. Tom's website is faithpilgrims.com or email trcaffrey at faithpilgrims.com. How about you? Will you be the 13th Apostle?